and it's Luke 24, 36 to 53, and it's on page 861 in your hymnal, um, in your pew Bibles. I'll read the first verse, and then we'll alternate. Um, This is after Jesus has appeared to the men walking along the road to Emmaus and then disappeared from sight. And um, the disciples heard about this, and they were talking about this event amongst themselves. And then this happened. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. He said to them, Why are you frightened, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. They gave him a piece of broiled fish. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day. You are witnesses of these things. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And let's all say the last two verses together. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they were continually in the temple, blessing God. Amen. Thank you, Patrice. Are we on? (laughs) I have it muted. How's that? (laughs) I'm doing the Brother Reed thing. Oh, praise the Lord. She's right. I do a lot of scripture. And uh, there's a reason behind that because the more scripture you have, the less you have to say. This has to be That has to be an old. Thank you. Thank you. Not sure you want to hear everything, but okay. Uh, hmm. Let me get my modern Bible open. To where I'm going to read. Well, we did try. The final departure. I've been thinking on this subject for four months at least, and long before the deacons asked me to to speak today. And uh, the Lord really is has kind of worked this message into me, and I hope to relate to you what the Lord has given me so that we all can benefit from it. And I want to read from 2 Kings, the second chapter, uh, the 11th verse, just one verse. And it came to pass as they still went on and talked that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by the whirlwind into heaven. Now, that's the old King James Version, and I'm going to give you my southern version. (laughs) Elijah and Elisha was walking, and they were talking. Now, Elijah had spent his life serving the Lord, and finally, in this final years of his life, he poured his soul out to Elisha. Elisha was younger. Elisha wanted to know about God. Elisha wanted to follow God. 
He wanted to know how to relate to God, and Elijah began to teach him that. So Elijah told him, my time is coming to an end here on earth. I am going to be leaving. Elisha, like many of us, didn't want to hear that. That was his teacher. That was his mentor. That was the one that showed him how to relate to God. And he said, but nevertheless, it's coming, and I want you to be prepared for that. What can I do for you, Elisha? And Elisha looked at him, and he thought about it real hard. He said, I want a double portion of what you have from God given to me. <laughs> Elijah looked at him and said, son, you're asking a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I leave, it's done. Now, Elijah had no idea how Elijah was going to leave out of here. Many times, we don't have an idea how each one of us are going to depart, right? So, they're walking along and they're having a conversation. This is going to be their last conversation. Think about that. Here is the man of God that has taught this young man how to follow the steps of the Lord, how to walk in God. And this is the last conversation on earth that he's going to have with this man. I wonder what that conversation was about. Well, how do I do this? How do I do that? There was a story in the Bible that Elijah caused an axe head to rise up out of the river. Now, you believe as you, as you take it in, but he wanted to know how you do all the things of God that you do. And Elisha was with him and talking to him about these things. And suddenly, he's gone. Let's fast forward to the time that Jesus is now on the mountain. And he has already been resurrected. He's walked with the disciples 40 days. <clears throat> and he is about to make his final departure from earth. And he, being Jesus, led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. We just read that. But in Acts it says, and while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, he went up. The final departure. In the flesh. Gone. Now what? What are the disciples going to do now? Well, he gave you a few instructions. Why don't you start there by moving forward and doing what he said to do, and then let's see what happens. So they know about that. There is a pattern that is laid out in the scriptures and throughout all of the scriptures that Jesus taught and practiced. And that pattern is what I call the letting go pattern. Letting go. Release it. Lay it down. Forget it. Put it aside. All these are phrases used when we are trying to move forward in this life. All of us know all too well the experience of moving on. Life is full of moving on experiences. Even at birth, we are in our mother's womb. And then suddenly, hello world, I'm here. Now what? I've got to learn to take food on my own. I've got to learn to breathe on my own. No longer having the warmth and security of mom to do that for me. I've got to learn to do this. Why? Because it's greater. There is a greater time coming for you and I. This baby has no idea how much joy it's going to bring its parents. Has no idea how much joy it's going to be living. Yes, there's suffering. Yes, there's, there's trouble. But there's a whole lot of good in it, too. So there's something greater than just staying in mom's womb. So the disciples knew about this letting go and grabbing on process. After Jesus was resurrected, they were still trying to relate to him from his earthly domain, from his earthly abiding. 
They did not understand that their relationship was changed when Christ rose from the dead. So, two guys are walking on the road of Emmaus, talking to each other about the terrible thing that had happened to Jesus. And this guy walks up from behind them, and they don't even know who he is. And this guy says, what are you, what are you talking about? He, they turn and say, well, don't you know? Where you been, man? They killed Jesus. And he begins to talk to them. He said, well, is this the one that was supposed to be the Messiah? Would, wasn't that supposed to happen? And, and all that. Well, he went, to, went home with them and ate, and they didn't realize it until he broke bread. Boom. Their eyes were open. It was Jesus, but in a different person. James, Peter, and John, three of the guys that stuck closest to the Lord. After the resurrection, Jesus had appeared and disappeared so many times, they didn't know where he was coming to go. So Peter said, well, I'm just going fishing. I'm tired of waiting. We get like that sometimes. So Peter went fishing. James and John went with him, and they're out fishing, and this man shows up on the beach they didn't recognize. And he hollers, hey, children, do you have any meat, any fish? They said, no, we've been fishing all night, no fish. He said, well, throw it on the other side. Well, hello. And the miracle happens. The phone goes off. <laughs> Throw it on the other side, and the fish filled up the nets. And James, I mean John, who knew Jesus the closest, the scriptures kind of tell us, turns to Peter and said, it's the Lord in a different form. Mary in the garden grieved at the crucifixion of her Lord. Jesus appears in the garden as a gardener. And she turns to him and says, Sir, where have you taken him? I'll go get him. I'll take care of it. Didn't recognize Jesus standing in front of her until he spoke to her. Mary, the sound of that voice does something to us. Because it was no longer Jesus in the flesh, but it was the resurrected Christ speaking to her. A few years later, a young man shows up. His name is Saul. You know the story of Saul. And um, on his road to Damascus, he had an experience with the Christ who spoke from heaven and said, Paul, why are, you why are you persecuting me? And Paul, brilliant as he was, didn't know who he was talking to. He said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecute, but not in the form of a man any longer. He was speaking from a higher elevation, from a different Perspective from a different place. And so Paul got it. The Messiah, the Christ, that came, was raised up, buried, crucified, buried, and resurrected. Now we all are a part of that resurrection. Paul got that. And he began to teach that paradigm about how we're to move forward. And I said all that to say this. Church, we are at that point right now corporately. We're getting ready to move forward. We have Pastor Justin, his wife Lauren, and I don't know why I can't remember my name. I know her face. And we, <laughs> and we are all together about to move forward into our future. It's time to thank God for what we have accomplished, what God's been with us, through us, and around us, what he's done in this community through this body of believers. It's an amazing time to be living in, and we need to have a renewed spirit and a renewed heart toward the future because God has got some great things available 
for the United Church of Lincoln, for the town of Lincoln, for the community of Lincoln, and for Justin and Lauren, all of us together. And we are all in this together. And I want to end what the Lord gave me with a quote from one of the brothers that I've come to love and appreciate. And he's basically he's kind of become my mentor, and his name is Richard Rohr. And he says this, All of us have to eventually learn to let go of something smaller so that something bigger can happen. But that's not a religion. It's highly visible truth. It is reality. <laughs>